Howdy folks, Jamboriki here, and I've just watched The Land Before Time Free, The Time of the Great Giving. In the Land Before Time Free, a meteor crashes into the Great Valley's water system, which causes tension between the herds. Meanwhile, Littlefoot and his friends are dealing with a gang of mean bullies, and they get so fed up of the grown-ups arguing that they decide to go on a journey to find water themselves. This movie can be very repetitive. A big chunk of it is just filler and padding. It's the same two scenes again and again and again and again. The adults bicker about the water problem, and the bullies harass Littlefoot and his friends. It can get really monotonous. And it's kind of annoying that it takes so, 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 so long for the characters to work out, hey, hang on, the falling rocks happened at the same time as the drought problem. Maybe there's a connection. The adults in particular should have been quicker to realize this, but no, they jump into arguments instead. And this is before they all become too hungry and thirsty to think properly. So they should be more rational at this point. I get that some of them are acting out of fear, but Littlefoot's grandparents are clearly being calm and collected. These are supposed to be the most responsible and smart characters in this franchise, and they should have immediately thought, okay, falling rocks, no more water, we need to look into this. Right, make sure the kids don't go out and start looking for water. I know they'll be very ambitious to do so, but we don't want them to get into any kind of trouble or danger. If you feel the need to immediately take away common sense and acute observation from your adult characters just so that you can avoid resolving the story's conflict too soon in order to preach a lesson about getting along and make the adults too tired and hungry to notice that their kids are going off on a dangerous adventure, then your script is getting too contrived and it's time for a rewrite. However, much like Land Before Time 2, the film does end with a climactic battle between the adult Leaf Eaters and a herd of predators, which is pretty kick-ass, but kind of a downgrade because last time it was T-Rexes, this time it's Velociraptors. I do feel as if that Land Before Time 2 set the bar very high in its finale. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Velociraptors are still pretty threatening, but not as badass as T-Rex is. <laughs> now, the antagonists in this film are a trio of bullies. Your usual cliche bullies, to be honest. It's your typical dynamic of the short one, the dumb one, and the aggressive leader. Sure, we find out why the leader of the bullies is so mean to the other kids, but that's not until later into the film, so it feels a bit late, especially when there's not really any foreshadowing beforehand, so it's not exactly well-executed development for his character. The thing that bothers me about these characters, though, is that they're unrealistically outspoken about being bullies. <laughs> me no bully either. <laughs> but I am! Here's the thing, bullies are narcissistic enough to convince themselves that they are not bullies. In other words, they don't go around saying, hey, I'm a bully, I mean. Now this film has three messages to teach. The first one is about sharing, and it's not very well handled to be honest, because in this context, in this situation, they're kind of sharing already. Let me explain. When the adults decide that they have to be wise about how much water they drink from now on, Sarah's dad starts policing a system where hers take turns, which is a good way of rationing out the water. Yes, Sarah's dad is being strict and harsh about the system, but someone needs to make sure it's being followed, or the water will run out too fast. Yet, the film frames Sarah's dad as out of line. Heck, it's quite cheeky for Littlefoot's grandparents to get mad about Sarah's dad's sternness when they were the ones who preached the huge importance of water control in the first place. What does this movie want Sarah's dad to do? Say, hey, it's fine, drink as much as you want, eat as much as you want, do whatever you want. There needs to be some kind of system. So I kind of side with the character that everyone is hating. If Sarah's dad was like, no one is allowed any water or food except for me, that would be a good excuse to demonstrate the value of sharing. But that's not the case. Another lesson in this film is not to be constantly aggressive to your kids. And to be honest, the film does a decent job with this one. You see, Sarah's dad is always yelling at Sarah, always shouting at her. And it gets a bit too much to the point where she's crying. 
But when he sees that the bully's leader's dad is acting the same way to his kid and his kid is being a dick and just venting his anger out on Littlefoot and his friends, he realizes, ah, hang on, not a good way of parenting. Yelling is no way to teach your child what is right or to show that you care. How would you know? I know because, because I have a daughter and I yell at her too much, especially when I'm worried for her safety. You don't have to worry about me, Daddy. If you always react with anger, that's all your son will know. And that's all he'll be able to express to others. I thought this film was going to go down a route where Sarah was going to be teaching her dad to be a better parent, which is an awful responsibility to put on your kids. But thankfully, he learns from his own experience. The movie acknowledges that mums and dads are often dragged into watching kids' movies with their children, and the film gives a valuable message for parents to learn. But I will admit that the film is kind of preachy with the message, and it is a bit too late for Sarah's dad to start developing at this point. The third lesson is about reaching out to your bullies and helping them work out why they are so angry. This is taught through a sweet little song by Littlefoot. It's a very nice sentiment and quite a mature way of handling bullies. They have feelings just like we do. They have problems too. We think because they're big they don't. But they do. You could argue that it's a naive message, as this tactic won't be guaranteed to work on every bully, but I admire the well-meaning intent nonetheless. Much like Land Before Time 2, this movie reuses, no, exploits James Horner's beautiful majestic music from the first movie. I find it so distracting and so lazy. Come up with your own score. You've not earned this amazing score. There are some original songs in this film as well, and to be honest, they're much more listenable compared to the ones in Land Before Time 2. They're less babyish, less infantile. It's mainly the aggressive characters who get musical numbers, so we get some hard rock and dark jazz kind of songs. They're not great songs, they're still crude straight to video productions, but I'd rather listen to the songs in this film than the ones from the second film. You're big, you can push all the little ones around. They're looking up while you are looking down. Life is tough, you gotta be tougher if you wanna stay alive. When the trail gets rough, you gotta get rougher to help your family survive. To conclude, I thought that The Land Before Time 3 was a mixed bag. Some things are kind of decently handled, but for the most part, there's a lot of stupidity, forced writing, and oversimplifying. Just because your audiences are kids doesn't mean that you have to just dumb everything down and oversimplify things to this level. Give them some respect, challenge them, give them a chance. They can think, they have brains. I'm not expecting anything too complex or complicated, but something more challenging than this. I've been Jambarik and I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, then feel free to subscribe to my channel because I make a lot of videos quite like this one. Also, consider making a monthly pledge to my Patreon in return for awesome rewards. Thank you. Cheerio, folks.